everybody. <laughs> Happy Friday. Um, so welcome to my live video for month is this August. I'm going to be talking about harvesting honey and um, hurricane <laughs> prep. We already had here uh, in Hawaii um, our first hurricane scare. Call it. it ended up being a tropical storm and on the west side we really i don't even think it rained um so first we'll talk about honey harvesting and then we'll get into some of the other stuff if you have questions related to what i'm talking about or related to anything with your bees feel free to post them in the chat and i'll get to them as i see them and it comes around in conversation or at the very least at the very end of the topic i'm done talking about all right, so honey harvesting is kind of that time of year where you're either thinking about harvesting or going to be harvesting soon. I'm getting a lot of questions from my students about it. Um, and first of all, there are, so all I'm gonna talk about are the three different ways you can harvest. Um, my recommendations for each option, depending on uh, the different situations you're in, uh, when you can tell is the time to harvest. Um, and how to know how much to take. Now, keep in mind that honey harvesting is a very, I mean, as with almost everything in beekeeping, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do things. So I'm gonna talk about what, what I like to do and my recommendations, but it by no means is, you know, the only way to do things. And it's really just a pet peeve of mine when beekeepers are very much it's my way or the highway kind of thinking. So um, you can harvest honey through a few different methods. There's an extractor, which is, you know, a big barrel and it spins around really fast. You use a centrifugal force. It's essentially like, you know, a washing machine uh, but for your honey frames and it spins the honey out. Now, this is what you use if you have a lot of hives uh, by far. Um, no other method of extracting honey is as efficient as the extractor if you especially have at least like five hives or more. Um, the thing is, is that I don't really recommend people getting extractors right off the bat because they're expensive, they're big, but most importantly, like, uh, you know, even if money was not you know, a problem or an option or something that you care about. There's so many options for extractors. And one, you might get into beekeeping and not like it. Of course, you don't get into beekeeping and do all this stuff thinking that maybe you won't like it and you're going to give it up. But it does happen. And it is actually fairly common for people to try beekeeping and then to be like, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to be hanging out with these cute little fuzzy insects and they were going to be giving me little kisses and I was going to have buckets of honey that I could share with my family and all would be happy. And instead it ends up that you're dealing with raw mites and putting chemical treatments in your hive and dealing with bees dying and it might not be what you expected. So I always recommend to people to give beekeeping at least a good year maybe two, before you decide whether an extractor is right for you. For some beekeepers, they go in the complete opposite direction. You know, I'm, I'm in that boat. Uh, I went from starting out with one hive, next year had two hives, next year worked for a commercial apiary, and fast forward maybe three years, I was working my way up to 20 with my goal to be 50 hives. Um, so if you go in that direction, then you start out thinking you just want a couple beehives and a hand crank is just fine. And then all of a sudden you're exchanging that for an eight frame or a four frame electric extractor that's going to be spinning it for you because you don't want to stand around and crank all of those frames out. So it's really great to just get a feel for beekeeping before you decide. Um, if you're going to use an extractor. Now, what I recommend it was the crush and strain method for beginners. And what you're doing is you're cutting out your comb if you don't use foundation. And if you do use foundation, you're gonna have to scrape it off and then just letting it sit on a um, strainer. So have some 
for you to look at. My first year beekeeping, I did the crush and strain method, and I don't know who, whose blog or whatever I follow, <laughs> they recommended using a cheesecloth. Don't. Don't do that. I don't. I, you think my common sense would have told me that was a bad idea, but it didn't. I don't know. Um, made a big sticky mess. It was stupid. And I only had like one frame of honey to harvest. <laughs> anyway, um, so you have strainers. You know, you're going to have probably a strainer in your house. I don't really recommend using your household thing for your honey harvesting because wax is a pain in the butt to clean and get off of stuff and usually leaves this residue. Um, but also, you want a bigger strainer than, you know, the one you're using for your loose tea or something. Um, so there's two different options. There's the round size that would fit over a five-gallon bucket, and then you have a bigger strainer that's more like a basket. Uh, what I like to do and what I recommend to people is that you just get a plate or a flat, shallow, large Tupperware dish and you um, squish your comb in that. Or if you have foundation, you're just going to scrape it with a fork to get the honey and comb off and then um, squish it further with your fork just to make sure you're popping open all those cells. And then you're going to just dump it onto your strainer. So, we have a five-gallon bucket right here, and the easiest way that requires the least amount of cleaning, the least amount of supplies, is to have your strainer fit over a five-gallon bucket, so you have these round ones, and your five-gallon bucket is going to be the kind that has a gate. So, um, here's my gate. I store it separately than the bucket, and you to put the gate on the bucket. Now I bought my bucket and gate from a beekeeping supply place. I actually think I got it through Mountain Lake on Amazon. It's here in Hawaii. Shipping is like so, 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 so expensive. And none of those free shipping for orders over a hundred dollars uh, applies to people that are not in the continental US. So um, you can just buy a gate buy a five gallon food grade bucket and drill a hole into it. I did not try to do that. I usually try to make almost everything, but that I didn't because it, um, these buckets were actually pretty cheap. I think I bought it for like $20. Sometimes you'll just find random sales on Amazon or um, through Man Lake. So that was why I didn't um, really mess with trying to make it myself, but you can just buy these gates separately. So, you know, it's just a gate that you put in the bucket and that's how you pour your honey out. So you put your comb with the honey in the top and you're going to wait a few hours, let it really just drip through. And then you're going to have your gate and you're going to pour it directly into the containers you want it to go into. And that is really a sufficient method that's just going to take like an hour or two, depending on how many frames you have, and is um, just fine when you have a, a few frames of honey, uh, because you just have like one or two beehives, and it's your first year or so of getting started. Um, if you have a little bit more beehives, uh, you can use the you can use the basket, which I got this large container. I think at a restaurant supply store, and then I just hang the basket inside here. Restaurant supply stores are really great for beekeeping stuff because everything's like twice the size of the kitchen size stuff. And so this holds a whole lot more honey if you have more frames. Um, I mean, it holds a whole lot more comb in the top of the basket than the round one does. But I like the round one because it goes directly into your bucket that you're going to be pouring out of. Um, yeah, one person says they just got their first two quarts of honey. It cost me about $1,250. That's about right. You're not, I mean, if you're looking to be like a homesteader and be self-sufficient, I mean, it would be so much cheaper to just go to a local apiary and just buy a five gallon bucket of honey for a couple hundred bucks and use that over the course of a year or two and be done with it and not get bees and equipment and all that stuff. 
Um, so that's the crush and strain method. And you, you give it a few hours, just let it sit. And um, the wax cappings, you are destroying the comb, I guess I should mention. You're not going to have the comb to give back to the bees. But this is really a method for when you just have a few frames and um, of honey that you're looking to harvest because it's just your first or second year. And it's really not a deal breaker if you're crushing this comb and, and you don't have comb to give back. There's going to be lots of comb in your hives over winter that the bees are going to be eating uh, and the honey from and you're going to have those for the spring. So it's really not that big of a deal if you're destroying the comb from this, some of these honey frames. Um, now there is the flow hive, which is another way to harvest honey. The flow hive is a Langstroth style beehive, but has flow frames in it. So you don't have to pull them out of the beehive. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, you know, there's a million videos and you can go to their website for information about that. Uh, I have a flow hive. I have it on the property of a hotel and it does make harvesting honey a whole lot easier there because they want me to harvest honey on their property. So, and I was, a, I was taking honey off of the hives, bringing it across, you know, the property up these hills and like on this cart. And this one part of the hill was sandy. I mean, have you ever pulled a cart that weighed over a hundred pounds on sand? <laughs> um, it's a pain in the butt. And then you're taking it to the employee cafeteria, which has employees that are scared of bees. <laughs> So um, it was nice to be able to just harvest right outside there at the bees. That being said, they only have four hives there. Um, when I'm out at my apiary with 20-some uh, hives in a location, once you start doing one hive or so, the hives are really large. Um, for me, here uh, is a lot of food for them to bring in. It attracts a lot of bees. I cannot just crank open one frame and pour the honey into a jar. The bees will dive into the jar. They actually dive into the little tube that the honey pours out of. I have to get a larger tube, connect it to the frame, the tube that the flow hive gave me, and connect it to a bucket, a five gallon bucket, which I've drilled a hole into the lid. So there is no way for the bees to get to the honey. There is no honey actually pouring out in the air, in the open for the bees to access. It's possible, it's really not a pain in the butt. It's just um, what I need to do because my hives are large and there's a lot of bees that are attracted to honey pouring, you know, of course. Um, so, but especially if you like are keeping bees at a school or at another location and you only have a few hives, the flow hive makes honey harvesting a whole lot easier and a lot faster. Um, one person was is asking about Penn State. Um, I did not work with Penn State. I mean, I lived in Pennsylvania, but I didn't work with Penn State, so I don't know anyone from there. Um, one person asked if you can store the whole super somehow and simply extract a frame as you need. Uh, yeah, you can. You can just pull a frame out. Um, you don't need to extract all of the frames in your super, but um, you just need to put something in its place. <laughs> so when I do, I do comb honey primarily. I have one one person that just buys a uh, honey, um, just like one honey company buys as much comb honey as I can give them. And so that's pretty much what I am selling. Uh, and when I was first getting started, I was concerned about the quality of my comb. The longer honey sits in the hive, the more the bees walk over the comb and it gets darker and darker. And I wanted the comb to be white or like really pale yellow, especially when I was selling to chefs um, at a resort. I wanted it to look perfect. So um, I would just pull out comb as I saw it, you know, it was capped to the point that I could take it. And I would just put an empty frame in its place. 
And then once it's time, then you, of course, consolidate the hive. And you would maybe if you have two or three supers on your hive, you'll consolidate it down to one or two supers as needed. But um, you do not have to harvest everything, especially if it's your first year. You can just take a frame out. That does bring me to one question a student had for me, which is, can he just harvest now, even though he's not going to be... Um, the bees, he's still anticipating the bees to continue to bring in more honey. He wanted to harvest a couple of frames now instead of waiting till the end of summer. Um, and uh, you can harvest earlier and do it in short amounts, but I recommend harvesting. And because you just never know how good of the end of the summer is going to be. End of summer can be really tricky because it can be really hot and your hives are still really large in population, but then there's going to be a point at which the flowers start, start to die. And if you don't get enough rain and the flowers start to die off like really fast and bees start to get really hungry, they get really angry, the population will go down, but it's not down yet. So you have, you know, like 40, 50, 60,000 bees flying around looking for food, not finding it, and they're going to start eating into their storage. So you can harvest like a frame early because you want to try it out, but I wouldn't assume how much honey you're going to have um, in your hive and then assume how much honey you can keep for yourself versus how much honey you're going to leave for your bees over winter until you are past that potential late summer dearth period and it's what they call it a dearth is when there's just like a food shortage shortage is not a lot blooming usually because of lack of um rain and then the pretty much any insect that eats honey starts to steal it that's honeybees wasps are a big one that can potentially just kill the entire hive um, I am foundationless in my entire hives to, um, one person that's asking. Uh, another question is, well, okay. So in addition to that question that he first asked, it's asked, he asked if you can store the whole super somehow. Um, if you want to take the entire super off the hive, I mean, for one, why would you want to take the super off the hive if you're not ready to extract? Uh, usually for me, the only reason would be for small hive beetles. If the population of your beehive is really low and you want to harvest just like a frame of honey and not the whole box, then you can take the entire super off and store it. I've stored honey frames in my refrigerator. I've stored them before I got married. I stored them in my uh husband then boyfriend's refrigerator <laughs> just he was like you know living by himself so i was like you're not using the shelf in your refrigerator and i started shoving honey frames in his fridge but i eventually got a chest freezer because um it made it a lot easier and you know those three cubic foot ones are pretty cheap um and and it made it a lot easier to store honey to just put it on another beehive um, so, so the flow hive is your other option, but of course that is a hive that you already purchased and put on your hive, your beehive and have already set up. Um, people do sometimes have trouble getting the bees to build into a flow hive. That can be something that you encounter. It helps to put a frame of honey, um, from another hive, from your deep box because the flow hive is a deep box uh just take one of those flow frames out they are wider than the regular wooden frames but that's okay there can be a little bit of a gap just put it next to the other frame so the gap is between your your um wall of the beehive and the first frame so at least you're only affecting one side of one frame and just put a frame of honey somewhere in that box putting honey in an empty box is really going to help encourage them to grow and take that queen excluder off you put that queen excluder on once they're starting to build comb and stuff but to start just take it off so that you're not discouraging um the bees from going up there once once they start to do stuff and it smells like bees and they've cleaned it out and stuff then you can put the queen excluder on if you want to use a queen excluder um 
Okay, so you also can harvest comb honey, which I mentioned is what I do. And um, comb honey is, you know, honey in the comb. I have, this one is for the mm, client I do it for. So it's a piece of comb in a jar of honey, or you can put it in a box. Um, I forgot to bring one of those, but you know, you can find them on beekeeping supply sites. Uh, you can buy the Ross rounds or the other boxes where you put the box into the hive and the bees build into it. Or um, you can just have no foundation on your frames. So this is something that you plan for in advance to do comb honey. And uh, if you haven't tried comb honey, I really think you should. <laughs> new things a lot of people think that it has to be like the whole super you know, buy these ross rounds and pay a couple hundred dollars or whatever it is for this like equipment but it actually can be just one frame and if it's just one frame in your hive you don't need to use wire you don't need to use any kind of little stick at the top you just put that frame in between other frames that have drawn out comb uh, doesn't have to have honey but just put it in between your other frames or even just other frames that just have foundation and just let the bees build on that frame. And I also suggest looking to see how quickly they build to that frame versus your foundation frames. Because you might be surprised to see that they build in that entire frame before they even touch any of your foundation. Um, so um, try comb honey. You can always just cut some and put it on a plate in your house. I, um, I just, I don't use those uh, containers for comb honey because I put it in these jars for this one client and I also sell it to um, some catering companies and they want them in less expensive cases because they're just popping it out and putting it in whatever their display is. So what I have is my um, a little cookie cutter. I just use this as a template. It doesn't stay sharp for more than like five uses. I just push it on the comb and then use a knife to cut around it. Um, I'm going to probably make a video of the entire process to harvesting comb honey, but just know that you can just pull your frame out of the hive with no foundation. Uh, you want to freeze it for a couple days and then put it on, you know, a baking sheet is good and just take a bread knife and you can cut it up you can cut it up into little squares and put it in your jars you can cut it up into bigger squares and put it into tupperware containers um there's a lot of options for comb honey the downside to comb honey is you lose the comb and bees have to uh, eat a lot of honey in order to produce beeswax and and so they're building all of that comb. You might find that the bees just don't make enough uh, honeycomb. And that's going to happen when you just don't have a big nectar flow. If you have frames with drawn out comb in them and the bees just have to fill it up with honey, uh, they'll probably do that. Come on, eat a bunch of honey, secrete your wax, fill it up. <laughs> Um, that's going to be a lot more and it requires a whole lot more food uh, available for them. So um, the hardest part for me being a beekeeper that does comb, comb honey is finding locations for my bees. And that's because here in Kona, it is a very big on commercial beekeeping and it's primarily queen breeding. There are some big honey producers. Um, one of the few organic honey companies in the country is here because there's so many lava fields where people aren't spraying. Um, but there's just so many commercial beekeepers. Uh, it's I'm just constantly moving my bees to find that sweet spot where there's enough food for the bees and not too much competition from other hives so that they can produce comb honey. So if you're having trouble with the comb honey, chances are that there's just not enough food for them <laughs> or you might have put it on too late in the year and it maybe the early summer would have been that sweet spot when they would have done comb honey okay so I'll try to answer some of these questions before I move on 
Misty says, I just started beekeeping in June. I'm not pulling honey, nor I think there's enough for them to survive the winter. But I'm also a newbie, so I could be wrong. Um, it's possible that there isn't enough honey for them to survive the winter. But that's why we put a um, super... You can get an eek, which is essentially a super but shallower. And you fill that with dry white sugar or you can make a hard candy and you put that on top. And so that gives the bees um, extra food. And um, if they do survive the winter or you do choose to beekeep again the next year, you really want to look into other places that you can put your bees where they might do better. My hives, I, they did really great. Um, and one, I met up someone at the bee club that wanted bees at his property and he was on the same street that my hives were on, but one mile up the road and I put them there and they did horribly. <laughs> um, not only did they not bring in much honey, but they actually did really poorly when it came to, uh, making their own Queens. So um, you don't necessarily have to move them 50 miles away, 20 miles away, but really just a few miles can make a big difference for them. Um, Conrad says he's zone four. So the supers come off all together next month. Uh, store and root cellar with covers. Um, so if you have frames of drawn out comb and you harvested the honey from and you need to store them until next year uh it really depends on how cold your cellar is getting at it in the winter time you want to keep it safe from rodents so even if it's cold if it's if, if they're still going to be like maybe mice or rats that are coming into that area they're going to eat the comb. Um, here, it's uh, <laughs> even when I was in Pennsylvania, it wasn't an option. I kept bees and I lived in a studio apartment. Uh, so <laughs> I didn't really have the option to storing them anywhere. And that's just a chest freezer it comes in handy. There are people that will store them, you know, in the cellar or shed or garage and they'll hang wire uh, so that they can hang their frames on the wire because cockroaches and mice and rodents um, can't get across the wire in theory, but um, so they just are in a safe spot. And that's essentially what you're just trying to do is keep them safe from insects and rodents, wherever that might be. If it's too cold down there for insects and rodents, then yeah, that would be a sufficient place. I don't have anywhere like that here. Um, the place I worked for, they had a room in their warehouse that they closed up uh, and they just had an air conditioner running or a few running to keep it cold enough to keep the um, small hive beetles in like a dormant state so that they weren't eating the comb, um, the drawn out comb in between harvests. And that was sufficient for them. Uh, it wasn't cold enough to keep rodents out, but I guess they just weren't able to get in through that that room since it was all closed up pretty tight. Um, one person says, I noticed some gray brown cells in the honey frames. Mm, I mean, it's hard to tell without seeing a photo of what these cells might be. And usually, I mean, sometimes things just uh, will die. The wax, wax is really poor, so it could just be um, propolis on that little part of the uh, frame. Um, it's, it's probably fine, or it could have been just like a tiny little, couple little cells that the queen laid eggs in and a brood frame that got darker because they do line those cells with propolis. Um, but if inside it is honey, then it's fine. Do not spin a frame if it even has a little bit of brood on it. You do not want dead baby bees, like goop, just floating around in your honey frame, in your honey bucket is, is kind of gross. Um, D 
DCs, bees. I pulled Capcom and store it inside in a dry place, but I save a little extra honey frames in case I want to give some back to them in spring. And that's exactly what I do too. I do not harvest all of my honey frames, but it's year-round beekeeping here. So there's never uh, a time at which it's cold enough that the bees are not leaving the hive um, foraging. But I harvest, uh, you know, September, early October, and then they don't really start bringing in honey again until uh, maybe January, but definitely not. Uh, they definitely will be starting February. So there is a good period of time when there's not a lot for them to be gathering. And that's when I will feed honey back to the bees. And the reason why I don't just leave the excess honey on the hives is because of small hive beetles. So you guys with the cold winter, your hive beetles are not going to be you know, roaming around, uh, getting into your hives and eating all, all this excess honey. But for um, for the warm climates, you can't leave excess honey on a hive when there be, the bees aren't bringing in a lot of food because the population will go down. You know, a lot of people blame the queen for a low population, but uh, the queen will not lay if there's not a lot of food coming in. So um, it's just like this balance that goes on within the hive. So the, the amount of food coming in goes down, the amount of laying the queen does go down. And so then you can't leave a lot of honey on your hive or other insects will take advantage of that and um so what i do is i store it in a chest freezer uh now i have two of them i have a 12 cubic foot chest freezer um for my comb honey uh to sell and uh, that's where i store it and it delays the crystallization <laughs> quite a bit in the freezer and then i have just this little five cubic foot freezer and that's where i store my feed honey to give the bees um, in the winter time uh, as they need it. Um, there is no dry place here. <laughs> There's really nowhere safe for the bees. Uh, I do have another chest freezer that I store my honey in um, and drawn out comb that is broken. Uh, uh, it's clean. There's no ants or anything living inside it. So I make sure that I freeze frames first in a freezer that works. And then I will put it in the broken chest freezer. That's my backup. Um, and that's where I'll put the extra feed frames. And they'll just hang out in the broken chest freezer because the gasket is still good. And so it's safe from the cockroaches, which are, you know, the length of my pointer finger here. And um, that works pretty well too. One person asked if the bees are mounding on the side of the hive, what should I do? Um, well, there's probably nothing that you need to do. Uh, there's, I mean, it kind of depends on what else you're seeing within the hive, but especially if it's later in the day, it's common for bees to hang out outside the hive uh, to deal with the heat and deal with the fact that all most of the bees are back home in the daytime. There's a lot of foragers out, but in the evening, even though it's cooled down, um, all of the bees are back at the hive. And so uh, it's just uh, crowded and can get hot in there. And a lot of bees will just um, cluster out on the side, but it is good to just make sure that they're not you know, preparing for swarming or that they don't have, you know, a small hive beetle infestation because I have seen bees cluster outside a hive when there's a hive beetle infestation inside because they don't touch the frames that are slimy. And so then they just essentially get kicked out of their home, <laughs> sadly. Um... Um, let's see. So before I get to some of these other questions, I just wanted to, um, finish this about the harvesting, uh, because there is the extractor <laughs> and that's really the preferred way to harvest. I really 
no matter how many hives you have, if you want to get an extractor, I don't recommend getting a hand crank one. <laughs> there might be kinds that are easier to crank, but gosh, I really hate cranking an extractor. I the the hotel that I keep these for, they have a hand crank extractor, and um, uh, we I, I brought a drill. <laughs> I attached the drill and took the crank off and attached the drill to the one the lever on the crank and um, spun it that way. Now, I don't know if I'm recommending telling you to do that because the one guy that was helping me like almost looked like he almost broke his wrist doing it because it just he he spun it too fast. Uh, you really have to go really slow to start and ease your way into it. And not all drills uh, are work well enough that you can do that. But I really hate cranking an extractor. The other thing, if you're buying an extractor that I strongly recommend is extractors that have a holding tank for your honey below the extractor. So extractors are just like a big cylinder. They have a basket inside where you put your frames. The smallest you're going to find is a two frame because you need uh, frames to counterbalance the weight. You can't just put weight of one frame in the extractor and spin it. You need to put another frame on the other side so that the weight is balanced within it. So you can get two frame or four frame, they get larger and larger, but um, uh, no matter what size, well, the bigger ones, you're not going to have this option, but for the smaller extractors, they can get ones that have a holding tank below. So after you're done spinning your frames, you need to get the honey out of your extractor before you can spin more frames uh, because there's just a point at which it really starts to pull up in the bottom and you can't effectively spin your frames. But there are extractors that have um, a hole at the bottom where the basket is with the frames and a holding tank below that. And that holding tank has the same gate that I showed you for my honey bucket so that once you're done spinning, you can just start pouring honey straight out of that tank below your extractor into jars. Um, otherwise, you have to stop every so often and get the honey out of your extractor before you can start spinning more frames. The, but the best part about these extractors is, is that as you start to spin more and more and the honey fills up down below, it adds a lot of weight to your extractor. And when you're spinning an extractor, um, especially the electric ones, it shakes like crazy. It's just like, like you're like holding it down so that it's not like, you know, like shaking around the room. Um, but when you have that honey down below, it's it just adds weight to it. And the extract, you're, you don't have to like hold this extractor down. It's not really moving much. It uh, stays in place pretty well. So that's the kind of extractor I recommend. But there's a lot of bee associations. I mean, the one in Philly had an extractor and members you know, had an extraction day. You could come with your frames and just extract with everybody else. And then it also helps you figure out when you should be extracting because if extraction day is next weekend, um, <laughs> it's probably time to pull your honey, even if you were planning on not doing it for another month or so. Uh, so I definitely just don't recommend getting them at first. You can try beekeeping out for a year or so and see how you like it before you go buying this big expensive piece of equipment that, I mean, like, is, you know, if you buy a chest freezer, at least there's other uses for it and stack stuff on top of it. But if you get this extractor, there's, you know, really not much else you're going to be doing with it. So it better be something that you actually, uh, a hobby that you actually like after giving it a go. And you know how many hives you're going to want in the end, because you might change your mind about, you know, just wanting one or two. So that's your options for harvesting. And when you're supposed to harvest is, I mean, I can't give you a date, uh, of course. It's going to vary depending on where you live. And not only that, but it's going to vary year to year. It, it's better to, so first of all, you want to harvest and then you want to treat your hive for varroa mites um, so that the winter bees that the queen is laying are healthy. So you can work backwards if you like. 
But if you're using a treatment, especially if it's organic, it's going to be in the hive for probably six weeks. Um, and so you want to harvest your honey before you're doing that. Now, the queen is laying these eggs late summer is usually the time. So you want to just harvest your honey before any of these treatments go in. Um, if you're in your first year, you probably shouldn't be harvesting any honey unless you're really seeing like an excess of honey, you know, like two or three boxes on your hive, or you live in a place with a really warm climate year round where it's not that big of a deal. If you harvest too much, the bees will be fine. Otherwise, um, it's best to just like leave the honey on the hive and see how much they eat. And then that'll tell, give you a, a start to how much honey the bees need to be left. In general, a lot of the United States, uh, it's good to have 50 pounds on your hive for winter. And if you're living in the more Northern states, uh, you know, like Maine, you, it would be better to be more on the side of 70 pounds. Now that might not be an option for you. So of course people put white sugar or candy up above the hive um, to help the bees out. And they will give the bees syrup throughout the late summer and fall uh, to help the bees produce more honey. But um, it's always good to give them a little bit more than not enough. Uh, so the average super weighs roughly 35 to 45 pounds. Um, you can take each individual frame out and weigh them, or you can weigh the whole super and then just subtract the weight of a box. I mean, each frame weighs, I don't know, I think just like two ounces or so. So it's really not that big of a deal that you're, you're including the weight of the frames in there. Um, but how much honey you leave on the hive and when you harvest is really just, it, it's got such a range that it can be tricky to figure out. It's always good to talk to other beekeepers in your area and see what they do, but not go by that as just the rule of thumb you should do every year. It's really important to just be paying attention to your environment and um, being a little bit more on the cautious side. <laughs> Um, now, some people harvest more honey and then they just leave a more candy up on the top of the hive. And that is an option. It's, in my opinion, nicer to leave the bees more honey, which is their food that they brought in, than to give them the white sugar, which is will keep them alive, but isn't good for them. Um, but it's really up to you as the beekeeper to decide how you want to, to do things. For most people, I mean, you're, you're going to be harvesting in the late summer. Uh, once the bees stop bringing in so much food, that's a good sign that like, okay, you can do a harvest. Uh, and so I have an inspection sheet on my blog at beekeepingmadesimple.com, or you can just make your own. But essentially, while you're inspecting, you should see how much honey is in the hive. I just, I just put a tick mark for the frames that I see and maybe not every inspection, but at least every other one. And once the amount of frames in the hive isn't increasing anymore and it's stable, then that's a sign that the honey flow is ended and you can probably do your harvest before you put in your treatment. Um, and the reason why you treat now is because the queen is laying eggs for the winter bees uh, in the late summer. And these bees are the bees that carry the hive through the winter. The bees are a little bit different uh, in their makeup than the worker bees that you're seeing in the hive currently. And over 95% of the rural mites in your hive are in the cells with the pupating bees, feeding off of them and they bring viruses and they really weaken these bees. So if your hive has rural mites when these bees are going to start their pupating stage, they will sneak in there before their cell is capped and they will weaken these winter bees, which means that these winter bees will either not hatch, they will hatch with the formed wings, they will hatch with the viruses and um, they won't be able to properly cluster when it starts to get really cold out and they won't be able to carry the hive through the winter. So if you're not sure if that's what happened to your hive, um, 
one sign that that's what happened is that once it started to like really get uh, cold out and they would have needed to form a tight cluster, that's when your hive collapsed and they died. And so it's usually a little bit earlier in the winter. You know, if they were fine come January and then all of a sudden in February they died, then it probably wasn't viral mites. But it's, um, I would say if you're not sure, it'd be better to leave the bees more honey than too little and to harvest earlier than too late. And keep in mind that there might be a dearth, there might be a time when there's not so many flowers blooming, but the population is still high and they're going to be eating into their reserves. So don't just leave them that 30, 40, 50 pounds of honey, leave them a little bit extra or put those extra frames in your refrigerator, your freezer, your root cellar that's getting cold, <laughs> whatever it might be, chest freezer and store it for a little bit. And once you're getting ready to winterize your hive and close it up, if you're seeing that they have enough honey, then harvest that, um, harvest that little extra bit. Uh, as opposed to um, harvesting it all at once and hoping that everything goes okay. So um, I was going to answer a couple questions here before I get into um, hurricanes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, some keepers I know store a box of capped frames in the box freezer. Yeah, freezing them. Um, I freeze my uh, um, comb honey and that's how I store it until I'm ready to put it into whatever containers um, clients need them for as opposed to just putting them into containers and hoping that they call me again. It, he says you need to let it warm up before giving it to the bees. So my bees aren't all at my home, so I'm never, I don't have the option to feed my bees frozen comb. But that being said, I have taken frozen frames of honeycomb, put them in my car, driven 30 minutes and put them into a beehive. Um, what's going to happen is they're just going to sweat because they go from cold to warm weather. Uh, it's, I don't really think it's that big of a deal, but the big thing you want to remember is that frozen honeycomb is really brittle and cracks and breaks really easily. So I have, you know, driven maybe over a rock or whatever, and some of the frames in my car broke. And I mean, you just take rubber bands and put them around your frame to keep the comb in. But just keep that in mind if you don't let them thaw out before you bring them to your hives, they're going to be a lot more fragile than you're used to. Uh, someone says they have someone here in Florida selling Kona Queens from Hawaii. Would that be from your stock by any chance? I do not do queen breeding. I do not like it. I think it's really mean. <laughs> it's a small scale. It's not too mean, but the queen breeders here is it's kind of mean um, how, how they're bred in large quantities. Um, I'm not a fan. I am not an advocate of uh, purchasing queens from Kona. The reason being that as far as I'm aware, they are not bringing in new genetics uh, here to Hawaii. And they are not allowed to ship in bees to Hawaii for good reason, even though the rural mite and hive meal are here and all that stuff. Um, so uh, I just think we're really limited in our genetics. Uh, the bees here, most of the queen breeders are really big. And what they're doing is they are breeding bees, queen bees, to sell like by the thousands. They're selling 10, 20, 30,000 queens to that honey company in Canada, primarily um, a lot of Canadian companies buy their queens from Hawaii. Or a lot of the pollination companies, they're sending their bees to the almond orchards in um, February. And they need to, often they're either just letting the bees die or they're, you know, requeening first um, in the beginning of the year. And so they need to get 
So they go to Kona because Kona has queens year round. But as far as like them being good queens <laughs> or dealing with role mites well or any of those things that a hobby beekeeper would want to see in the genetics in their hive, I don't really think they're going to find them in a Hawaii queen. But um, if that's your only option, then that's your only option. And, you know, you make do. I have Hawaii queens and they do fine, but they are also in an area where there is um, lots of food. And I do have to treat for varroa mites. They do not handle varroa mites on their own. Uh, one purse, Allison says, do you still, do you check the moisture content in your honey before you extract it? I do not, I do not check the moisture. You can buy, um, what's it called? A refractometer or something to check the moisture. I don't, it's been so rare that um, I've had any trouble fermenting and it's a pretty humid climate here but i am very i do not harvest frames that are like 50 percent capped 70 percent capped is like the minimum but since i do comb honey i don't really want to sell people a piece of comb that has open cells in it i want it to be capped um so i just be i'm a little bit more cautious and i don't harvest those frames that um have actually probably even like less than 80 percent cap and it's gone pretty well. Um, Misty says, I got bees from a local beekeeper. He was a block away and she thinks they returned to his hives. Probably not. Um, uh, you don't have to move bees far. They say a mile. I've, I've moved them less than a mile. It really just helps to like put something in front of the hive so that it looks different and they figure it out and they know that they're in a different location. Um, when you place them down, usually when they do leave the hive, you'll see them flying in little circles up above the hive and then bigger and bigger circles. And that's kind of like this like orientation play and get to know the area before they go off in search of food. And that's a good sign that the bees know that they're in a new spot and they have to get to know their new surroundings. So if you do move them and you're seeing that, then you know for sure that they know that they were moved. Um, Calvin wants to know, uh, if you live in Hawaii, where would you recommend buying a starter colony? Gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> I used to sell um, nukes and I don't anymore. And I do not know, I do not know anybody who sells them. I could probably get some from my former employer, like if I was to need them. But really, there is a really big demand for people to catch swarms and do cutouts. So if you're up for that, you could probably make a couple hundred dollars instead of spending a couple hundred dollars. And, and find a hive. <laughs> it's it's um, always getting calls from people that need or emails that are looking for someone to remove a swarm and they can't find anyone. And the people I knew have also left the island, so I don't know anyone either anymore. It has been pretty hard to find people selling bees here on the island. Um, I know Bird and Bee does beekeeping classes and sells beekeeping equipment. They're up north, I believe in like the Honoka'a area. They might be selling nukes, but I'm not really sure about that either. Um, let's see. Okay. 
Um, Big Bob wants to know if I let bees clean or rob out harvested frames before storing. I don't, um, and the reason, well, sometimes, but uh, they're not my bees because I don't have bees at my home, but I do harvest at my home. So when I do harvest, I will often just take those frames that are wet with honey and leave them outside for the day and the neighborhood bees will clean them up pretty quickly um or i'll just hose them down if you know my kids are outside and we don't want to attract too many bees but i don't leave them by my beehives and the reason is is that you do not want to attract wasps and bees from other hives to your area because there is a time when there's a dearth and not a lot of flowers blooming they're going to remember this area as an area with free food that was easy to get and they're going to come back and it's a good chance your hives are going to start getting robbed a lot so you do not want to leave honey outside your hives you can put them in another area of your property the other thing is that when bees rob not just like each other but just find honey around um they look oily it's it's um really weird these like kind of look all black and oily and i saw it a lot when i worked for a bee farm especially on the extraction days but whenever they were doing something and had a whole lot of equipment with honey on it outside there would just be thousands of bees everywhere just going crazy on this equipment and um the one beekeeper told me that it was like a deficiency and something that they get when they go into that robbing mode and then it's not good for them to go into that robbing mode it didn't make much sense to me because they're finding free food and not only is it like it's not just nectar but it's honey so it's got it's already ha has all the work of you know evaporating the moisture from it <laughs> so i don't completely know why this would be bad for them but all i know is that i have seen them look very ill and sickly and dark and oily when they are in this crazy robbing mode so i bring them to my house and i let someone else's bees rob my equipment but i don't let my own bees rob my own equipment Um, Z best hardware said, I have a question about beehive management as you extract are bees less prone to swarm as long as you extract aggressively. Yeah, extracting honey is not going to change whether they swarm or not, because you whether they swarm is dependent on how much room is in the brood. And so it doesn't matter how many empty supers you put on the hive. Uh, but especially if you have a queen excluder on and you're limiting the queen to those first two boxes, it doesn't matter how much room is in the rest of the hive. You still need room in the brood. Uh, without room in the brood, they're going to start to take off. uh in a small extractor three frame how long do we hand crank is it like five minutes or much longer in general per side um i don't think it's like three minutes i guess it depends on how slowly you're cranking it but it's usually like you just do it for i don't know it feels like a minute or so but um i don't know it's been a really i only used a hand crank twice once on the extractor that I put the drill on, uh, I don't know, seven years ago and never cranked it again. And um, once when I was doing a work trade on a farm in New Zealand, the guy had a two frame hand crank thing. Um, it was like five of us doing it and we all took turns and we would do a few frames and then we would switch to the next person. His was on the floor and I think like plastic or something. It was a lot easier to crank than the big metal one that the hotel had, but it was still annoying and exhausting. I don't think it was like five minutes though per side. That's, that's excessive. In three minutes, I would say probably tops. 
But again, look into your bee clubs because the one in Philly had an extractor that everyone shared. I know during COVID that was probably like a big, big no-no, but now they might be offering it again. Um, Junebug says, I see a couple of small comb clumps on the bottom of a frame that have several larvae. How do I know what type of bees are being formed? Should I scrape these off? No. Well, I'm not an advocate of scraping things off, especially if you don't know what it is and why it's being done. Um, and I don't really think it's up to us to decide whether it's something that is good or bad or not. It's probably good if the bees are making it um, and they're putting the time into it. Uh, I mean, so if you want to know what kind of bees are being formed, um, I mean, you have a queen, a drone, and a worker. You have like a... <laughs> Nine out of 10 times, it's probably a worker just because that's the majority of what's in the hive. It's, uh, I mean, queen cells can be found at the bottom of frames, but you're really not gonna be able to tell until they start to build the cell out and hang it off the frame. And it is gonna be from a worker bee size cell and the drone cells are a little bit larger than the worker bee cells. So even when drone cells are empty and there's nothing in them or just an egg or a larva, you know it's a drone cell because it's a little bit larger than the worker bee cells. So you can always take another frame or just look at the other parts of the frame and see if that cell size looks to be about the same size um, or use something as a unit of measurement, like you know a part of your pen or something. And if it's the same size as the other cells, then the cells that have honey in them or worker bees, then it's a worker bee cell. Misty says, should I start treatment now? I haven't seen any mites yet. Well, you're not usually going to see mites on the bees. Over 95% of them are on the pupating bees inside the cells. Once you start to see them on bees, you have a big, big problem. And that means there's a bad infestation. So um, you can do a mite test. You, the best result is with rubbing alcohol, but you can use powdered sugar too. And you take a sampling of bees and shake them with the powdered sugar or rubbing alcohol and see what you get. I have a video on my YouTube channel to show you how to do it. You just use, you know, like plastic cups and some hardware mesh. Um, but, uh, when you want to do this is really just when the honey stops coming in and you're ready to harp, you've harvested or you, well, you said you're probably not going to be harvesting. So then, yeah, especially if your hives you said are small and they haven't brought in much, then it would be good to just do a mite test now, or just put in a treatment because there's a good chance that they might just be weak because of viruses brought in by the mites. Um, and if you don't have to worry about honey, then then I would recommend doing it. You know. um, one person says, my bees are in a single deep and they haven't drawn any super frames. Do I overwinter them in the single deep? Uh, yeah, well, if you have other hives in the apiary, then you might want to merge them with that other with another hive and pinch your queen. But first it would be good to figure out what exactly is wrong with these bees. So do a little bit of troubleshooting because um, you don't want to infect a strong hive with your weak hive. So first, um, uh, first you wanna see, like think about what they were doing when you first got them. Were they strong? Were they active? Were they just, um, or, or were they just always not really doing much? Because if they were strong and then weakened midsummer, then that's a common sign of nosema or tracheal mites. Um, nosema and tracheal mites are things that can be detected through taking bees and killing them and looking at them through a microscope. 
there are some universities that have laboratories that you can send the bees to if you really want to look into it but do not merge them with another hive. You can try to overwinter this small hive and see how it goes. A small hive can be overwintered, but if it was a small hive because it was split and is strong, um, that's different than a small hive that had the potential to grow and just never did. Uh, so if your hive was just always weak, then you want to ask yourself if you ever treated for varroa mites or did a mite test to see what your mite levels were. And if you haven't, then there's a good chance your hive was just um, already had viruses when you bought it and nothing was done about it. And the viruses and the mite levels are just increasing and increasing and they're hanging on, but they're not uh, strong. Uh, in that case, you can put a treatment in, uh, depending on your climate, you might have enough time to treat and let the bees um, recover before deciding if you want to introduce it to another hive and merge it. Um, and then it also could just be the genetics, which means it's the queen's problem. <laughs> so if it is just the genetics and they don't have mite infestation and they were never strong, then the queen another hive um, and give another hive the opportunity to uh, a greater chance of survival through the winter. If you only have one hive, then yeah, just let it overwinter and see what happens um, because it's really your only option. Uh, Gina asked if I have a website where I sell my honey. I don't, I took it down a couple of years ago. It was a pain in the butt, <laughs> a lot of work. I was tired of going to the post office. So I only sell wholesale now. Um, and don't do any more retail. It's a lot easier. You make less per jar, but a lot less work. Prefer it. Um, and then Jean also asked, how do you control the heat in your hive living in Hawaii? Um, I don't. I mean, the lids are white. I don't paint the boxes dark colors. They are in full sun. I don't have them in a shady spot except for the hives that are on the beach. The, the hives that are at the resort are like oceanfront property. Those are in a shady spot. Otherwise, all the other hives are out um, in full sun. And that's because it's, even though it's hot, it's not horribly hot. We're, like, we're closer to the sun and it feels hot, but the temperature isn't that hot, but it's humid. So the humidity is more of a problem. They can get like really wet in the hives. I've seen a lot of moldy brood. I've had moldy equipment. I've had mold growing on the walls inside the boxes of my hives. And so I'm more concerned about that. Up in the higher elevations, there's a lot more flowers. It's a lot more lush, a lot more rain. It's not as high and the clouds come in around 11 o'clock in the morning. So it's really tricky for me to film the videos for YouTube because I need to get out there <laughs> before the clouds, but definitely the rain um, comes around like, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning. So what I am trying to mostly concerned about is keeping the moisture down in my hives, not so much the heat. Um, so I keep them in full sun and then also the small hive beetle in these really wet areas. The hive beetle population is through the roof and I want to keep that low. So I have them in full sun because they can, the hive beetles really just pupate in the ground and the population is through the roof um, in the shadier, wetter areas. Uh, the bees do a pretty good job cooling down the hive. I mean this, I do put um, additional entrances in the supers. I drill a three quarter inch hole into most of my supers so that the bees have an additional entrance. Uh, my equipment does start to fall apart. If you've noticed in some of my videos, I outlet that, I don't care. It's just additional entrances, additional places that the bees can stand and fan their wings and help ventilate the hive. And um, I mean, the one yard, there's a farm with donkeys and they have a water trough right there. So the bees go to that water trough and um, 
in other areas where they don't have water, I have a trough for them. And you just put some like water plants in there and um, make sure that they have access to water so they can fan down the hives. But I don't like to let them be in the really dry areas like the where they are at the resort for that reason because it's really hot and dry not a lot of food it's just not really a great spot for bees they don't do incredibly well except for these four month part of the year when the kiave is blooming and other than that it's it's just not really a good place for them fortunately we have so many climate zones so close together so i just move the bees to climate zones that are a little bit better for them but if you're having trouble with heat, if you can put them in shady spots, keep the equipment light colored, have water for them, and the cooler areas, the better. If you can go up higher in elevation, try, try to do that, but, you know, it's not always an option. Uh, Lisa says, I live in PA, and I have a small rescue colony. They filled not even half of a 10-frame box of brood. Will I need to sugar feed over the winter? My last inspection, no honey frames seen. So, I mean, all colonies, you're going to have to give them sugar. Definitely not syrup. You don't want to feed liquid uh, syrup in a hive in the winter time. You don't want that um, extra moisture in there. So, you want to make sure it's candy or white sugar. But um, yes, even if your hive was strong and you had 50 pounds of honey on it, you'd still want to put that extra feed up there just, just as a backup plan. But you, if you rescued this colony, keep in mind that they, they might have had a problem. So bees swarm, uh, and that's a good thing, and it's often a sign of a healthy hive, but bees also abscond, and that is when the queen and all of the bees in the hive take off and start at home somewhere else. And they will often abscond if they are sick, if they have a viral infestation, that means they have lots of viruses. They will abandon the brood, which is where over 95% of the mites are, and start at home somewhere else. Or if they have a small high beetle infestation. So um, if the colony was small when you rescued it, it's a good chance that they absconded because they had a problem. So you can, um, test for mites or put a treatment in if you never did, because there's a good chance that they had a really bad mite load on them. Um, and hope for the best. If you can give them some brood uh, from another hive that you have, I would. But um, those small rescue hives, those colonies often don't bounce back from absconding. Uh, they it's, it's really just like a last resort for them, but it's kind of like a Hail Mary. <laughs> it, it often does not uh, like get them far, unfortunately. Z-Best Hardware said, I got your answer about bee management. So do I keep adding empty frames to the brood section to no end? Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that is a really good way to prevent swarming. If you can split your hive, like if you have a hive that's, I mean, I've, I've had hives like this. They're like just the really great hives in the apiary and the queen's just going crazy and she's constantly laying and it's just exhausting, especially with year round beekeeping to be constantly going in there and pulling frames out of the brood section. So the best thing to do is to split that hive and take the queen, take, um, three frames of brood from each box, put some empty frames in there, and put that split somewhere else. That queen, since she's already laying and going crazy, she will continue to lay, and that hive will get big fast. And the hive that's queenless will get smaller, and you won't have to worry about them trying to swarm or there being too much brood. Um, if you don't want to do that because you like that the hive is big and bringing in lots of honey, and you don't want to mess with that, because, you know, like the commercial apiaries, they don't split their hives in summertime. Well, you know, not the ones here. Um, when the bees are bringing in honey, they don't do that during honey season. They split their hives in November when no honey is coming in. Because they don't want to take away from their honey. That's, that's what they're there for. Uh, so if you don't want to 
you know, take away from what these bees are harvesting, then make a split. But you want to take like three frames of brood from each box and put them in a split or another hive that's weaker or give it away to somebody. And when you do that, that's six frames of brood that you just took from them. And it will be like a good month or six weeks, depending on how fast your queen lays and how fast your bees build before you even have to worry about um, giving more space to that brood section. And if those frames are empty and don't have any drawn out comb, that's even better. I highly recommend going foundationless in your brood boxes. You're not harvesting this. You don't have to worry about it falling apart in an extractor. Um, just throw some empty frames in. You can slowly do it. Put an empty frame in between two frames of drawn out comb and you don't have to put anything in there because they're going to build in a straight line, just like all the other frames in the hive. And um, then, you know, it's not like a constant battle, like every every other week, you're taking more and more brood frames out. Uh, Misty says, I can't kill the bees. You can do a powdered sugar test for my testing, but it's not going to be as accurate. <laughs> The bees do die when you put them in the rubbing alcohol, but for one, I mean, thousands of bees are dying every single day in the hive. So it's, it's not like you're killing these baby bees that have, you know, a whole life ahead of them. You're, you're, you're like, um, you're, you're doing this to bees that are probably older and at the end of their life cycle. But really, you have to start looking at a colony as an organism, as opposed to each individual bee, because that's how the colony operates. They, a bee will die stinging you, but she still does it because she's doing it in defense of the hive. Bees are constantly killing the pupating bees in the cells. If they think that bee is infected with viruses and mites, they will kill it, uh, pull it out. They will poke holes in those cells. Um, I mean, bees are dying for the sake of the hive and the sake of the health of the hive all the time because of the bees' decision. So I think it would be better to just kill a half a couple bees once a month and to like know for a fact what's going on with the health of them than to have the hive collapse over winter because you just didn't know what was going on. The powdered sugar works okay. But especially if you've never done it before, powdered sugar clumps up. So if you have any um, open comb that has nectar in it, the nectar might fling out of the cells um, or you just get some kind of water somewhere and it clumps up and it's just really hard to get the mites to fall off. Um, if you go to scientificbeekeeping.com, Randy Oliver has a few different options for things. One is, um, I think, water mixed with like Dawn dish soap. I don't know if that kills the bees, probably, but there are some other options other than the rubbing alcohol um, that are a little bit more accurate. If you do use the powdered sugar, um, just keep in mind that you need to increase that number. Add like one or two. To the number you get because it's it's not going to be as many mites as you would have gotten with using other stuff uh, uh, acid for metallic acid for control sometimes uh, i currently treat for mites once a year and so i rotate my treatments because you never want to use the same treatment here since there's always brood present oxalic acid is not you know, you can't just use it once. You have to keep going back like every six days or something technically. Uh, so I hate it. I hate doing it. It's really time consuming to to do that with every single hive I have. Um, but I, you know, I haven't done it in like two years because uh, I only use one treatment every year. So I will rotate it with the formic and apigard is what i prefer to use that one is not organic but are considered organic in europe and is uh thymol based um so yeah it's just it, it's quite a pain here uh with no brood present to go back and keep doing that for four treatments uh with all of the hives Um, 
so I gotta go because my daughter woke up, but my home, my husband is home, so she's not running around by herself at the age of 22 months. Real fast, I uh, wanted to talk about hurricanes because hurricane season's coming. I did film a video, so I'll be posting that soon. And I also just finished filming a video about queen cells. I made a chart. It's also in the community section of my YouTube channel um, about what to do if you see a queen cell and like the different ways, the routes you can take depending on what you see in the hive. But uh, we already had our first tropical storm go by. So if you live in an area where you experience hurricanes or, you know, excessive wind and rain, some things you want to do uh, to help your bees are um, you want to help them deal with the wind and the rain. So one, it's really important to make sure that nothing is going to fall onto your hive. So if they're like under a tree or near a tree with big saggy branches, try to cut those branches down before they potentially fall onto your hive. Or you can move the bees. Now, this isn't something you maybe want to do, but if you can put them next to a windbreak, you know, the side of a shed, garage, house, um, that can be really helpful. It is going to confuse them. So you want to do it ideally once it's like, you know, after sunset, uh, not in the middle of the day. And also keep in mind that bees are really mad. <laughs> when a big storm is coming if even though it might seem totally calm and bright and sunny out uh there's just something that they pick up on it might be the anxiety or the nerves of the beekeeper or something else in the environment but they are really angry so do not go out there and do something really fast and get stung in the eyeball okay um i saw one person get stung in the eye he still can see, but don't do it. I've been stung up my nose a couple times. Really super painful place to be stung. Had a beer go, bee go in my ear. Also awful. Um, so keep that in mind. They're really, really mad at that time of year. Um, also just take off the empty boxes. So if you have a super with just like that's mostly empty, a couple frames of honey, take that box off. Put the, you know, shake the bees off so they go back in the hive and just put it somewhere. You put the frames of honey maybe in your fridge temporarily and just leave the empty equipment sitting somewhere on the side. Uh, you can ratchet strap the hive together to the stand. If it's on a stand that's a little wobbly, um, cinder blocks work really well. As a stand, just make sure it's high enough up that you don't have to deal with uh, a flooding and water coming into the hive. But uh, the cinder blocks really work really well because you can ratchet strap the lid to the boxes to the cinder blocks um, all in one, one big swoop. And if you are concerned that the hive isn't heavy enough, you can always put a cinder block on top as well to keep it down. Um, and of course, if you're in a low spot at the bottom of a hill or something and you're concerned about flooding, you can elevate it a little bit more, put it on some more cinder blocks or pallets and close up the entrance a lot, but not entirely. I don't really think it's good to close it up entirely. Some people do. Um, you, just to keep too much of that wind and rain from getting in, but you put an entrance reducer on it or maybe even a mouse guard. So you just have like a small, small little gap. A three quarter inch is sufficient for the bees to get through. And then the rest you can close up. Any other gaps in the hive, you can close up with duct tape. Um, and then of course, if there is any uh, water that gets in the hive, you want to make sure that there's a way for it to get out. So if you have a screened bottom, that's fine. Uh, usually people will put like um, one of those boards, like the corrugated plastic, one of those sticky boards you got to treat for mites um, or to test for mites or something under the screen bottom. So not a bunch of wind is getting up in there, but um, just leave a gap so that 
there's a way for the water to go through the screen and get out. Or you can just tilt the hive so the back is just a few degrees higher than the front so that the water gets out that way. But of course, you need there to be a little bit of an entrance so the water is getting out. Um, now, you can't tilt it just like a degree because I forget what the technical term is, but the water that's pooling up in the bottom will actually move. You need it to be a few degrees so that it's actually going to fall. Um, it, it's odd, I think, but bees, like I've seen bees drown in like the tiniest little pool of water on the bottom board. It's really interesting because you think it wasn't deep enough for them to drown, but they do. I don't exactly know like what, what the reason is for that because I've also seen them swimming in pools of water. So I don't really know if it just gets on their wings and they, what's going on. Um, now, the farm I worked for, there was a really big hurricane hitting to town one year. The farm I worked for, they had, you know, a few thousand hives. So they're not going to do this. They're not ratchet strapping all their hives down and putting cinder blocks and doing all this stuff. Um, they're not closing up the entrances. Uh, this one big hurricane was heading to the big island and we did board up the windows at the store and they went out to the yards and they just screwed the lids down. Like they just took wood screws and just screwed the lids down to the uppermost box. Um, I don't recommend doing this because then you have a hole in your equipment. Uh, but... <laughs> That is something you can do as a last resort just to make sure that like that light little piece of wood that's on top of your hive doesn't fall off. I had a top bar hive when Hurricane Sandy came through. Um, that was the hurricane that came through the, I don't know, I guess like 11 or 12 years ago. Um, and, you know, like New York City lost power and the subways were flooded and they were rationing gas and stuff. And so this was in Philly and I had a top bar hive and I had taken bungee cords to keep the lid down. Now, don't use bungee cords. It might seem obvious, but just for anyone who might do something stupid like me, uh, they have some give to them, even though it didn't feel like it. I put all these bricks, like a put every single brick I could find in the yard on top of this hive and still the wind just kept hitting the lid. Um, now I made this top bar hive. So the lid was just like a wooden lid, but I had taken plastic siding and put it over on top of the lid, screwed it down on top of the lid. So the wind was hitting the plastic siding that had that lip over the lid and just kept hitting it and hitting it until all of the bricks, I think probably like started to shimmy off and um the lid fell off <laughs> luckily one of my neighbors saw it and he went down there when it was um had calmed down and put the lid back on thankfully because uh i lived in another part of the building the, the bees were on the roof of the parking garage connected to the building and so um he put the lid back on thankfully and the bees survived and they were just fine <laughs> I also had a hive actually fall over. I've gone out to see, check on my bees and the box was completely on its side. Lid was off. The bottom box was still there. And the upper brood box was on its side and the upper brood box was fine um, because it was just on its side. And fortunately the bees were able to keep that brood warm um, even without a lid or a bottom. And the lower brood box, I believe that brood had died because of all the rain that had gone inside it. But I, the queen was in the upper brood box, so I put that box back on the bottom board, put the lid on top, and the hive survived, and they did just fine. Um, you tilt the direction towards the entrance. So wherever your entrance is, you want to tilt the... You want to make that part of the hive lower. Um, so, you know, if this is your beehive, here's your entrance. You want to tilt the back up so that if any water pulls up, gets inside your hive, it won't pull up on your bottom board and it'll flow out the entrance. Um, or at the very least, it's flowing towards one little side of the hive as opposed to sitting on your bottom board in, in a puddle.
Um, so I might be forgetting a few things with the hurricanes, but that's that's what I do. Um, we don't have. I, I've been here ten years, and I haven't experienced a large, uh, severe hurricane hit the town that I live in. It just the one hurricane hit the east side of the island, but there's um the mountains in the center just caused the storm to stay there for hours and hours and then by the time it finally made its way to the west side it was just a little bit of rain so um living in the middle of the pacific ocean actually i have experienced um terrible hurricanes where my bees are but that's what the beekeepers here do and um I'll be putting a video with a little bit more tips about um, other other things that other beekeepers do to deal with strong wind and rain uh, shortly. And um, so I got to go real fast. Uh, I did start offering memberships. And what that means is that like for $2.99 a month, if you have questions, you're posting questions to my channel videos and you're not getting an answer. Sorry about that, but I don't always have the time to check all the questions and filter through all of the mean comments or the weird comments on the flow video. <laughs> That's what a lot of the comments are. So um, if you pay $2.99 a month, you're a member, and that means that I get notified when you ask me a question so that I can actually answer it. So if you have questions and you just need someone to ask them, to ask someone to talk to about them, <laughs> Uh, that's what the membership's for. It's kind of like a, a cheap alternative for people that just need a little bit of help. Uh, so if you go to my YouTube channel and you hit subscribe, then there will be a button that says join next to subscribe. When you click that, you'll see the option to become a member. And then I'll be doing some live streams just for members. Um, and uh, if you pay for the higher membership, I'm going to be making some labels to put up there for you guys to download. So like labels for honey and candles and stuff um, for a variety of sizes and shapes uh, based off of some of the labels I've already made because I uh, am a graphic designer. This is what I went to college for, what I did for 10 years before running away to Hawaii because I didn't want to work for a marketing firm. But I still do it a little bit on the side. And um I want to be able to share that with some of the people that are looking to get their business up and running, but don't really, you know, have the ability to hire a designer to go make them labels. Um, so that's it. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks for everyone that logged in and all of the support. I am working on uh, getting a new camera, <laughs> camera, mic slash and microphone to make these videos because I'm still currently actually just using my iPhone and I am running out of memory. So thanks for all the support because all of the times that you comment and like and, um, you know, watch all of those annoying ads on my videos that helps bring in payments and of course my online beekeeping class uh, so that I can, you know, spend a little bit more time doing it and buy some better equipment so thanks for that and happy beekeeping and hey if you have uh topics that you want to know about especially topics now like this time of year um uh, you can email me i'm going to put it in the chat it is info and beekeeping my keyboard is like off to the sides. <laughs> I can move my computer and you guys don't see the big mess over there on that side of the room. Okay, so info at beekeepingmadesimple.com. There's my email right down in there. If there's a topic you really want to learn about, especially if it's one that you're having a hard time finding information on, or if there's parts of it that are still confusing to you, that people are, like, you know, being a little evasive about. That was always a, concern, a problem I had was that people would talk about a topic, but they wouldn't answer the hard parts of it. They would just tell you to do something and not explain, like, where you're supposed to find all of this stuff. Um, put those in because those are the videos that I want to get out there and to address. Um, 
because there's more than enough beekeeping videos out there. I don't really need to repeat some of the stuff that other people are saying. That would be really helpful so that I can focus on helping people and the stuff that they need help with. Um, happy Friday. Bye.